Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. The message today is, is, is what I would call a survey message. I was actually planning on preaching an uh, after checkup message, um, but the Lord, I, I woke me up early in the morning and said, these are some words that I have for you, and I want you to develop your message today based on this, and I said, oh, Lord, you do this to me again. But, you know, that's the challenge of, of being led by the Lord, as opposed to just preaching your opinion. Right. And so, let me say one thing before we get started. As we are journeying toward the fellowship that we are becoming, we want you to know what we are about. And so, the back table, uh, we gave it out on our fifth Sunday, is our little bro brochure pamphlet that references um, our mission, ref references our vision and our values, uh, where Encouragement Kingdom Outreach wants to go. And if you're a person uh, who is, who's not just a follower, but a leader, uh, you wanna be going in a particular direction. And so we have a direction that we're trying to go, and I want you, to, if you haven't taken one, to take one, and to say, you know, as we get to, we're year two now, we get to year three, the question is, who's gonna be all in? Who's going to be riding with us after year three? Because we're gonna to have to ask people to make a decision. Are you gonna be a member? Are you gonna be regular? Are you gonna give? Are you gonna support? Are you going to do what's necessary to sustain what we got going here? Now I can say the Lord can sustain it with us four no more shut the door. But you know what? We want to be about the Father's business. And we wanna get things done in this city and for the kingdom of God. And to do that, we need people who are faithful, people who are consistent, people who are disciplined, and people who have integrity with the Lord. Hello? And so that's the kind of fellowship we want to be. And uh, we have been a part of fellowship, all of us, of one kind or another. We know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, guess what? We want to keep the bad and get rid of the, or keep the good, rather, keep not the bad. Keep the good and get rid of the bad and the ugly. Do I have a witness in here? We want to keep the good and get rid of the bad and the ugly. And so, praise God. Now, the challenging part about that is that we all that we got people involved. <laughs> we got people involved. And when you got people involved, you might get all three. But you know, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep praying that the Lord will help us. Amen. 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 Last five weeks, I was preaching a message called It's Time for a Checkup. And that checkup was that that survey of the body that's given to Christ that now uh, is, is going to see if it was fit for the kingdom work of 2023. God, would you examine me? Would you, would you ask this question? Are you willing to allow God to examine you in such a way that he might say you are indeed fit for his kingdom purpose? All too often, you know, those of us who've been in school and those of us who are getting a little bit older, we know we need to get examinations. I know when we were in elementary school, we had to get our, our shots, if you will. We had to go to the doctor and get that measles shot or rubella, whatever it was, back in the day. They need to check it off to make sure that you had your shots. And your parents, you know that. As we get a little older, we need to make sure that we have various and sundry examinations to make sure that, that as best as we can, that we're okay. Now, they might find something that you didn't know you had. And instead of being uh, proactive, now you're being reactive. But you know what? Without the examination, you couldn't begin to get the healing that you now need. What if God wants to continue to heal what's, what was wrong in 2022 and make it right in 2023? That you might be involved in his kingdom work. Well, you know, God has a plan. He has a progression that he's leading us on. And let me just walk you through the steps. The first challenge for us is to love the word. Now, again, I'm not asking you to, to know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but you know what? If you just open it from time to time, if you, you'll see something that, that you know familiar, that is familiar, or you see something that is, that is unfamiliar, and now you can read it and learn. You can go to John 3.16. You can go to uh, Romans 3 and 23, Romans 6 and 23, 1 Corinthians 5 and 17. All familiar passages of scripture. And it'd be helpful every now and then to say, you know what? There's some passages that I need to, I need to get in my, my mind to remember. Romans 8 and 28, where we are more than conquerors, you know, in Christ Jesus. 
uh, Romans 8. Oh, Romans 8, 28. For all things, and we know that all things work together for, for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We are going to Congress, that's Romans 8, this is the first, first part. All right? We'll be talking about that in a moment. So it's helpful to be able to not only know the word, but to fall in love with it. Also, we need to have some time in his presence. Time in his presence. God asked Moses to go on a, on a long journey of, of, of victory and of challenge. And Moses says, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to go. If, you, if I don't know for sure that you're with me, I don't even want to go. And so we need to spend some time in the presence of the Lord. Just like we did just now. Whether it's worship, whether it's prayer, whatever it is. We're spending so much time in the presence of so many other things. I wish to God I could have, could have had an opportunity to grab the mic at Pinnacle Reno last night. 15,000 screaming folks and say, Jesus is Lord! They would have run me out of there, but that's okay. That's what we get off the court. That's okay. What else do we need in 2023 to get where God wants us to be? We need to, we need to ask God to increase our faith. We're up and down. We're like a come up. We'll go up and down sometimes. Sometimes we're with the Lord, and sometimes we're just we're just we're just milk toast. Just milk toast, soggy bread. And, and I'm praying, Lord, increase my faith. Help me to be, and not only increase my faith, but help me to be more faithful. More faithful. The other challenge we have as we're journeying to God's place in 2023 is we want him to build me up in love. You know, I can get a little salty sometimes. Anybody, am I looking at anybody here? I can get a little salty sometimes. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, I don't know if I want to love that person that much. But you know, when I think about how much the Lord has loved me, we used to say it back in the old church, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. If I, when I think for a moment about God's forgiveness and God's love and his patience, you know what? That gives me pause. And now I can do those things to other people. But if you don't think about that, then you get in your feelings. Okay. And next thing you know, you're ready to knock somebody else out of your head. No, no. Uh, would you pray with me, Lord? Build me up in love. Because folks don't appreciate you the way they should. Folks will take you for granted. Do I have witness in here? Amen. They'll take you for granted. They won't give you what you think you deserve. <laughs> Be careful. And lastly, lastly, as we, as we move from the loving the word, timeless presence, and an increase of faith, being built up in love, what, then what's the end game? The end game is being more useful for the king, God's kingdom purpose. Being more useful because the idea here is, is that we're not trying to build a body of spectators. We want people who would actually want to be in the game. Huh? In the stands yesterday, there were some of us who were spectators, but there are actually people who were actually on the court playing. And I know some of us back in the day, we would just wish, oh boy, if I could be out there. Oh, if I could just be out there. The shots they were missing, I would make. The thing they were doing wrong, I could do right. But you know what? We were spectators. Well, you know what? You don't come here to be a spectator. You come here to be involved in the plan of God. Using whatever gift he has given you. Whatever skill, whatever talent, whatever tool he has given you. And, and that should, should be your prayer. Lord, how do you want to use me? Whatever it might be. In front of the scenes, behind the scenes, whatever it is. How do you want to use me? Greater usefulness. We have a challenge. And I want to give you these three things. And again, this is the survey uh, that I want to give you. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And I'll, and I'll journey in, into a couple of places. But I'm going to start here first. In Matthew chapter 6. Three words that all too often mark the life that we don't, we shouldn't want to live. The, the life we shouldn't want to live. The first of those three words is worldliness. They all start with W, so that's okay. 
We all start with W. What word of it? I mentioned it in part here earlier. We'll sing a song at the very end uh, that says, I surrender all. Some of you have sang that song many times. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Now, the problem with that is that most folks don't mean it. They sing it, but they don't mean it. Because to give the Lord everything is to give him more than most folks want to give. I said last week, last week, all of me. Why not take all of me? And you know what? He wants all of me. But you're like, Pastor, I, I, there's some things, there's some shows I want to watch that I know Jesus wouldn't feel comfortable sitting watching with me. There's some things I want to do that I know Jesus, if he was with me, he wouldn't feel comfortable sitting next to me. He wouldn't approve of this. Exactly. Which means you probably want to give it up. You might want to surrender that. Huh? And so that first part of the life we shouldn't want to live, we, won't, we don't want to be marked by worldliness, carnality. And, and Jesus says here in, in 19 and following of Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. He, he's talking about stuff. That the, and again, that's not just that you shouldn't have things, No. He said, but don't let the things have you. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's the kingdom purpose that we're talking about. Where, where neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in his hill. And here's the key here, verse 21 of Matthew 6. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, or vice versa. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. And so that's the key. We do not want to be given to world. The other reference is in 1 John chapter 2. You can go there with me as well. <coughs> Toward the back of the Bible. 1 John chapter 2. James, Hebrews, 1 and 2 Peter, 1 John chapter 2. And John here gives us a, a, a bit also of how, of, of what we should be mindful of, and, and, and that's in contrast to how some people think about how this works. And I've said it many times, you, you don't become a, we, we don't believe because it works. It works because we believe. It works because we believe. And John here in, in chapter 2, 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 50 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. And again, the word operative word here is love. Don't give your devotion so wholeheartedly to the things of this world. And if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And for all that is in the world, listen, to you, listen carefully, the lust of the flesh, and that's where it starts. It starts with what this body desires. So don't even talk about the devil. Don't even talk about the enemy. Let's start first with me. The first enemy that I see every day, I wake up, is right here in front of me in the mirror. This flesh. And the question then becomes, and I said it last week and I'll keep saying it, is that if you can answer this question with regularity, in the affirmative, you will save yourself a lot of trouble. Who do I want to please more? Do I want to please God more? Or do I want to please myself more? Who do I want to please more? And if the answer is more often God than me, you will win. And if the answer is me over God, you will lose. And I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm saying that because I've, I've lived it. I've lived it. Every time I've tried to put myself out there in front of God's plan, I have lost. God has a design. He has a plan. He has structured the world in his way. And when you step outside of his design, I'm here to tell you, whether you're online here or whether you're sitting in front of me, you will have problems. Amen. Problems that you can't resolve. You can call it conflict. You can call it dysfunction. You can call it whatever you want. But God has designed the world after his own pleasure. You may not like it. 
You may not want to agree with it, but you know what? If you fight against it, you'll have a problem. You'll have a problem. So that's the first thing. The lust of the flesh. Oh, he goes on, John says. He says also the lust of the eyes. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm just, I'm not what I'm saying. It's what the Bible says. Keep, keep, be careful what you look at. Be careful what you're looking, what you're watching. Be careful what you give your devotion, the devotion of your eyes to. Huh? Job, Job says that, I think it's Job 31, he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I might not sin against you. I have made an agreement with my eyes that I would not sin against you, God. A covenant with my eyes. The lust of the eyes. So here's the question. What are you looking at? Is God pleased with what you're watching? Is God pleased with what you're looking at? What you want to look at? And then, he says, the pride of life. And what does it mean? No, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be proud. It should mean that, 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 that be careful when, when it's all about you. When it's all, when everything is, is focused this way. And again, of course, we have children. We have little small children sitting here. And guess what? The whole world revolves around them. That's what they believe. But there will come a time, <laughs> hopefully sooner than later, when they realize that ain't the way the world works. The world does not revolve around you and everything you want and all your desires. Uh, as a parent, the word no has to come out of your mouth. Because that's the word that's coming out of their mouth. Come on, let's go. No. Say what? I don't want to go. I'm not, I'm not advocating for that, by the way. I'm just, just, talking, about my own, just talking about my own experience. <laughs> talking about my own experience. Listen to what he says here as he finishes this passage to John to 17. Once again, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, listen, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it doesn't seem like it though. Seems like seems like the lust of the world is elevating and elevating and elevating. We get, we're getting more perverse and more profane and more this and more that. And everything that seems to be ungodly is okay, and everything that's godly there's a problem with. But whoever does the will of, of God abides forever. So be mindful and be careful of worldliness. The second of those three items I'm going to talk to you about that, that should not mark our lives is the, is, the, is the word worry. Back to Matthew 6. Back to Matthew 6. Worry. Now, every time I talk about worry, the people who worry, they're the first ones to look at me. They're the first ones to look at me. Oh, here he goes again. There he goes again. Okay. He gonna be telling me, now you trying to tell me, now you trying to get my business. Well, that's my job. That's my job. To get in your business. Particularly as it relates to what the word says. Alright? So our lives should not be marked by worry. In Matthew 6, 31 and following, take a look. This is Jesus. This is in red. It says, therefore do not worry. Oh, okay, stop right there, service is over. Do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. But here's the key. Now, the key for me is not, not, not to tell you not to worry. The key is the next verse. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Huh? Your heavenly Father knows what you need. Pastor, I feel better worrying. I feel better being anxious about it. I, I, it, it that's, just, that's, just, that's just who I am. And Jesus is saying, be somebody different. You know, if you can change your mind, you can change your life. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all, this, all these things, and again, it's not everything. It doesn't say everything. It says all these things. What things are you talking about? With what you eat, what you drink, and what you wear. The basics of life will be added to you. 
People want to say, well, it's everything. It doesn't say everything. It says all these things. And what are these things? They're the things that he's talking about in the previous verses. All these things will be added to you. Once again, get in your business, Pastor. Scramble their eggs. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Here we go, Ooh, Pastor. Here we go again. How many of you already thinking ahead to money? How many of you already worried about money? Oh, I know. I know. I know. You already worried about money. As soon as I get you, get you talking, and we walk out, your money will be the, be the first thing you start thinking about when you walk out this door. And the Bible says, don't worry about tomorrow. Why? For tomorrow will worry about its own. <laughs> Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Listen, what is he saying? Well, Jesus is saying, there's enough trouble left today. There's enough concern today. There's enough things for you to be worried about today. Don't worry about tomorrow's trouble. Deal with today. Because you might not get tomorrow. Deal with today. Be God's kingdom person today. I won't ask you to turn to this, but I'm going to ask you to write down this reference. This is Philippians 4. Philippians 4. And I think we have the wristband in the bucket back. Where Paul says to these believers in Philippi, rejoice always in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Right, well, anybody say amen? Anybody say amen? Here? Anybody say amen? Here? And maybe I didn't read. Maybe I wasn't clear. But I was spoken in French. Was that French or Spanish? What I was speaking? Let me just do it in English. Do not be anxious about anything. Amen. I heard some breathing out there. I knew somebody was out there. But pastor, I just like being anxious. I just, it's just, that's just who I am. And I'm saying, Jesus is saying, be somebody different. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation. Now, the caveat is, there's, there's a reason why. But in every situation, think about it, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, he's giving you the, the process here, present your request to God. Huh? So instead of worrying first, let's pray first. Let's give it to God first. And God says, if you do what I've designed and what I prescribe, guess what will happen? Verse 7. And the peace of God which transcends even your understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Scram scramble your eggs, Pastor. Scramble your eggs. Scramble your eggs. Yeah. So, does that mean you, everybody automatically will leave out of here and not worry? No. Nah. No. Nah. But my prayer is that you'll remember what was said and instead of immediately going to worry, you'll go to God. Yeah, yeah. Huh? So, the things we don't want to be marked by, first of all, worldliness, and we don't want to be marked by worry. And the third thing we don't want to be marked by is a constant deluge of warfare. Or a, con a constant thought, thinking all the time about the warfare that's going on in my life. The battle that I'm always fighting. Some people in a given day, I hear it all too often, will continue to say to me, the devil's busy, Pastor. The devil's busy. And you know what? The devil is busy. But you know what? The devil's not greater than God. The devil's not greater than Jesus. The devil is not the one who will have the ultimate victory. He might black a couple of eyes. He might punch a couple of holes in some tires. He might create some chaos. But the devil does not win. And so I want you to be careful. Now, let me just say it this way. When, when a Christian's life, life is marked by constant warfare, it means one of two things in my experience. It means, first of all, that they are on the edge of something great in the Lord. Huh? 
You're starting to pull your family together. You're starting to be the, the husband your wife needs. You're starting to be the wife your husband needs. You're starting to be the person the world needs. And guess what? God, the devil knows that you're just about to be elevated in the kingdom. And guess what he wants to do then? He wants to bring you down. He wants to bring disobedience and doubt and distance between you and God. That's what he did in the garden. The plans don't ever change. The plans don't change. He brings diso doubt, disobedience, and distance. So you're in constant growth work because God is about to use you mightily. Now the second part of that is you're in constant warfare, or at least thinking you're in constant warfare, because once again, you haven't surrendered fully to God. So you don't know how to fight spiritually because you're not fully surrendered. You're playing, you're playing the Lord's shame. You're going halfway. You're not praying. You're not doing anything that's a spiritual discipline. You're not doing anything. And when the devil comes, guess what? You're not ready to fight. You have no armor on. He got your butt naked. And you in trouble. Uh, yeah, I said it. Warfare. Warfare. And so the challenge here, mark this note, 2 Corinthians chapter five, uh, 3, rather. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, of course, I want you to mark the note in Ephesians chapter 6. Because that's where the, 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 the encouragement of Paul to the Ephesian believers is to put on the full armor of God. That you might be able to fight the devil. Because he's coming. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the thief, Satan, Lucifer, or whatever you want, he comes only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And when something is being, is in that middle of three veins, you know who it is. You know who it is. Things falling apart, folks acting a fool, guess what? You know what's going on. He has shown up and he's trying to kill, steal. And destroy. You you think the devil wants your family to stay together? He wants your husband and wife to be on the same accord? He wants your children finding you? He wants everything at work going well? Huh? You think he wants that? No, he doesn't. He's only come to steal, kill, and destroy. Second Corinthians 3, 5 and 6 says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not part of They're not of this world. You can't pick up a stick and fight the, fight the devil. You can't pick up a stick. But mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And that's the challenge we have. We, we call it, many people call it generational curses. They call it, you know, our family is this and our family is this. We can't get over this and we can't get over that. Whether it's incest or infidelity or whatever it might be, we have this thing that is a stronghold in our family and we just can't get over it. Then maybe we need to, we need to get, some, get some folks in the family who are willing to get bond together and start praying together. I thank God for my wife. She did that for our family. Uh, a year or so ago, she got us on a Zoom call and she got all about it. She said, listen, we need to pray as a family. We need to pray as a family. And not everybody got on, but guess what? Enough of us got on. To begin a process to bring healing to our family. Now, are we all there yet? We are not. But I tell you what, we're not where we used to be. Did we see victory? Yes, we did. Do we have testimonies? Yes, we do. More than we would have had if we hadn't done anything. So I thank God for her. So our weapons are not warfare. You ain't going to take the Bible and throw it at them and get victory. No, you better start praying. You better get some folks together. And you better stop playing. Because these strongholds, strongholds are just that. They move from generation, and if they're not broken now, they'll go to the next generation. And if they're not broken there, they'll go to the next generation. And, and, and generational blessing will turn into generational curse. Listen, let's go for generational blessing from generation to generation. Let's pass that on. Let that be our legacy. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, I like that. See, that's the thing we got to do. 
That's the, we, we recognize, you know, they say in the school, you see something, say something. Well, guess what? Then we should do that in the church. We should do that among believers. If we see something, say something. If we see some foolishness going on, some stuff that's outside the will of God, we need to say something. Oh, pastor, don't get over it. Oh, it's just a phase. No. No, friend, you're out of line. You're out of line. This is not what we do. This is not who we are as a family. This is not what we represent. You're out of line. And the church needs to be that way too. Huh? I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to tell you. In love. And so again, we're bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And that's what's key. Not the obedience of Pastor Harris. To the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So when you've got warfare going on, one of two reasons. It's either you're ready to do something great for God and the enemy's on your track, or guess what? You ain't ready. You're, 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 you're in the twist in between. You're playing one foot in and one foot out, and the enemy says, guess what? I got you. I got you. Because there's three places where he thrives most. Just watch National Geographic. You'll see it. Those of you who love National Geographic like I do, I love seeing those cats. I love seeing those animals running across the prairie and that cat grab right back in there. Ah, gotcha. It's not that that I like. It's, the, it's the, the process. And what's the process? How does the cat or whatever the predator is, how do they win? How do they end up getting the, the food? Well, first of all, they're looking for something that's weak. Huh? When, when the animal, the new, the I've seen where the animal is just about to have the child, the little beast about to have the, the baby little beast is coming right out, and guess what? There's a lion right there ready to catch as soon as it comes out. Or, they, or the baby is just born, they can't run. Got it. Something young. Guess what? You need to grow up in Christ. What else is he looking for? He's looking for weakness. He's looking for that animal that's just limping along. It hit a rock, it hit something, and the leg isn't as strong as it, and now it can't run as fast. It's weak. And now, I can run faster, which means I'll get you. Young, weak, and lastly, the thing that COVID has done to the church, to church members, more than anything, alone. When you separate from the herd, and you think you can make it on your own, guess what, friend? That's when you lose. Too many people have left the herd thinking that they can walk this Christian life all alone. And guess what? They're depressed, oppressed, suppressed, you name it. And even if you've got to be among three people in a fellowship, you better get there. You better get there. Because you are positioning yourself for warfare, war warfare that you cannot fight from your own. How should we be marked? If we're not marked by worldliness, worry, and warfare, how should we be marked? I'll give you these three things that we'll be done. We should be marked, friends, by wisdom. Wisdom. Mark this note. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Hear me right. I want you everybody to hear this. This is Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Huh? So be careful who you're associating with. Huh? Be careful who you're associating with. I'm going to say it one more time. He who walks with wise men will be what? Wise. But the companion of who? Fools will be what? Destroyed. Huh? Man, that's a good word right there. I don't care what else you heard today. Watch who you associate with. Everybody who, thinks, who says they're your friend is not your friend. And even your family members. Everybody says they, they love you. They ain't love you the way you need to be loved. Huh? They ain't the way you want to be loved. Watch who you get counsel from. 
Watch him who you ask for advice. Yeah. Ephesians 5, 15, 21. I won't read it all. But it says here, see that you walk circumspectly. Be cautious. Be careful. Look, you know, be wise. Not as fools, but as wise. This is Ephesians 5, 15. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Do I have a witness in me? Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but filled with the Spirit. Hmm. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things for God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another in love. Be careful. Be mindful. Don't associate with foolish people. But partner with the wise. You also want to be associated with, not only with wisdom, but with wonder. Wonder. One of the things I think we've lost in the church today is the awe of God. The question I'm going to ask you, maybe you, you don't have the answer, maybe uh, I need to give it to you. Is God still in the miracle working business? Is he still the same yesterday, today, and forever? Can he still do what he did for Moses? Can he do for, for John Harris today? For Sister Catherine? For Charlotte Harris? Can he do it for any of you? Yes, he can. Listen to this verse from Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord? among the gods. Who is like you? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders. Who is like you? Who is like you? Listen to what Job said in Job 9 and 10. He does great things past finding out. Yes, wonders without number. <laughs> Listen to Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory or the wonder of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Just look. You wonder about God? Just go outside and look at the sky. Just go outside and look around and see the handiwork of God. Jesus, throughout the Old New Testament, showed the wonder of his healing power. Just walk. Listen. Do a survey through the book of John. John 4, he heals the official son. In John 5, he hears heals the paralytic. In John 6, he feeds the 5,000. In John 6, he walks on the water. In John 9, he heals the man born blind. In John 11, he raises Nicodemus, uh, Lazarus from the dead. Wonder. Miracle. Get some, get some pepperoni on that. See, I'm talking about a wonderful God. See, we lose the sight of God's wonder. And our lives should be marked by the fact that we expect God to move. We expect God to move. What we pray for, we expect that when God has promised, we hear in Romans 4, he is faithful to perform. Amen? So we want to be marked by wisdom. We want to be marked by wonder. And lastly, we want to be marked by winning, by victory, by victory. We see, we used to sing that old song. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary. To do what? To save a wretch like me. I heard about his healing, about his healing power revealing. And then I repented of my sins. And I did what? I won. The victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever. Who fought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory. Believe the cleansing flood. So, we should not be marked as believers by defeat. We should be marked by victory. Praise you, Jesus. 
John 16 and 33, Jesus says, in this world you won't have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And if those of you who want this hand, I'll give it to you. Ephesians 6, 13, put on that full armor of God, that when the evil day comes, you'll be able to stand. And when you've done everything to stand, stand all the more. Psalm 3, 8, before the Lord comes, from the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. And it's not only victory here, it's victory later. Not just victory now. As I said to you earlier, knowing that whatever you do in the Lord now is not in vain. He sees you. He sees you. And there is a crown of righteousness yet to be realized. And I want you, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to be done. I'm going to read this whole passage. Praise the Lord. My Lord. God is so good. He is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Let me make sure I get my reference right here. Praise you, Jesus. The Lord has been so good. I want to just give a recap just to those who may have come on late. The first challenge of our lives is not to be marked by worry, worldliness, worry, or constant warfare. The word warfare that is associated with either our being elevated by God or not being positioned rightly with God and therefore under attack under constant attack under constant attack the word of God says here and forgive me I, my reference has gone off the page that's okay I'll find it and I'll give it to you it, but it is the right word so that's all I'm at. That's all, that's all you will come to. It says here, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor, this is from Corinthians, I know where it's from. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound in the day will be raised incorruptible. And we will be changed. This is, this, is, this is at the end. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that this corruptible has, as when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall we be brought to pass as it is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sin? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Here it is. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Huh? So for all that you're doing, and for all that you think you're doing, if you're doing it as unto the Lord, your reward is certain. And not only will you have victory here, you will have victory when he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Are you in it to win it? I pray that you are. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you have given us an opportunity to glean it together and to understand. And I pray, Lord, that whatever someone came in, in need of today, just a nugget touched them. Something that was said, something that was sung, something that was done touched them. And I pray, Lord, that you would not be mired in worldliness, but 
that we would be in full surrender to the person of Jesus Christ. And I pray also, Lord, that we would not be mired in worry, for indeed you know what we need. I pray also that we would be ready when the warfare comes, fully surrendered to Christ, that the, the schemes of the enemy would not prevail against us. And I pray, Lord, that we are marked by wisdom. For the Bible declares that if anyone lacks, any man lacks wisdom, we should ask God. Who gives liberally, who gives generously. And that we should not associate with fools, but those who are wise, that we might become wise. I pray also that we would also find ourselves in a place where we are amazed by you all the more. The wonder of your hand continues to show itself to be real in our lives. That we believe your word and we believe that what you have done before you can do again. So we're thankful today that you are God who is the same yesterday today and forever. And I pray today that we would be a people marked not, not just by winning because we're not believers to win but we are marked by victory because you are victorious Lord. You have shown us the way. You have gone before us and you've defeated even death. Death on the cross. You were raised and in this Lenten season, in this season where we acknowledge your resurrection. We're, we're acknowledging the greatest victory in human history. Jesus being raised from the dead. And so today in this place, for saint and sinner alike, I pray, oh God, that we would all recognize our need for you. That we would all recognize our need for your salvation, for greater faith, for full surrender. And if you're here today under the sound of my voice, and you're willing to say, Pastor, I've heard many messages, and I've been down this road many, many times, and I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted. And even though I, I even know what's right, it's the lust of the eyes, it's the, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, the pride of life. I don't know if I can give Jesus everything. Because there's something I want to keep for myself. I don't know if I can give him everything because I, I, just, I just can't. Well, friends, there are those of us who've been there. And I'm here to tell you once again that God has a design. That he has a plan. That he has a plan for you. And all he's asking, all he's asking is if you would trust him. That he would trust, you would trust him with your life better than you would trust yourself. And if you want to go at it, thinking that you know better than the one who created the world, that's a tough go, friend. But if you're willing to put your hand in the hand of the one who created everything, even you, you'll have a better chance, not only in this life, but in the life to come. So I'm just going to ask you, if you're here or if you're online, just to join me in the first step of, our, of your walk with the Lord. Would you just join me and say, Father God, I come to you today just as I am. I've heard the pastor, but I've heard many sermons from him before. And something today, though, has touched my heart. Something has cut me to the quick. Something in the scripture, something by your spirit has touched me. And I've been going my own way. And it's only, I've only met pain and, 
and challenge. And today, today, I'm willing to try to do it. I'm willing to give my heart in full surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mindful of his love. Mindful of his sacrifice. Just for me. And I'm not saying, I don't, I don't know if it will be easy and I don't know if it will be similar to what I've already gone through, but I know it's the right thing to do. And I don't know if it will solve all my problems, but it will make my heart right with you, and that's all that matters right now. So I'm willing to walk this walk. I'm willing to give you my life, Jesus, as my heart is open. Come on in and reside here. Implant your spirit here that I might live for you all the days of my life. And that I might be like the Apostle Paul who was no longer Saul. Able to go before those who saw me differently and say, yes, I'm on the Lord's side. Yes, I'm with Jesus. And the challenging thing will happen, friend. Your friends will become your enemies. And your enemies will become your friends. And you'll be walking with the Lord the way you should be. And so say again, yes, Jesus, I say yes to you. Yes to your salvation, your forgiveness, and your love. I want to be in the family of God, serving the kingdom of God for the glory of God. This is my desire and my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you've done that, I want you to see me. I want you to talk to me. That's step one. There's more to do to say yes to the Lord in full surrender and to walk with Him all the days of your life. Would you stand with me? Oh, to Jesus, I surrender.
Pussy Bear. <laughs> you keep it up, you're going to be taller than me. <laughs> <laughs>